So I think a lot of it starts around caring and then being a tool or a vessel, if you will, to start connecting those dots and doing what you can within your communities or your organizations and with the individuals you have relationships with to inform, educate, and empower. How do most agents who don't have access to the secrets that the top agents in our industry hoard to themselves grow and prosper in today's real estate environment? That's the question. And this video podcast is the answer. I'm Pat Hyman, and welcome to Real Estate Rockstars. Real Estate Rockstars, this is Aaron Muchistegi. Hey guys, we are going to record just a great podcast today. I've got two guys on with me. I've got Paul Morris, who you guys have heard a lot of different times, and we've got Rod Watson. You know, the Rod is a you know he's got a, a really interesting company. I'm excited for you guys to hear about it. He has a, he you know the LA VIP team. So with that, he caters to kind of high end clients, really really unique stuff. We're going to talk all about that. But right now, all you guys listening out there, as you hear this, the world is also going crazy, right? We had like a few months in a row where everything we were talking about was, was coronavirus and shelter in place. And I tell you what, with the week, with the news of the week now, it's like coronavirus and shelter in place. We're not even thinking about that right now, right? We're thinking about everything else that's going on in the world, you know, and Rod, uh, you know, is working and living out in LA. I think he's also going to give us a fresh perspective about what's going on out there. And so, you know, I hope everybody just really looks forward to listening to us. So Paul and Rod, thanks both for coming on. Thanks a lot. Yep. Thanks for having me. Uh, Rod, I really appreciate you, you jumping on. It is, uh, it's a great delight to be back in business with you. Um, we, Rod and I were in business before we get into business again, uh, prior to all of the social unrest that's taking place right now. And Rod, uh, you know, I had Rod scheduled to talk to a, talk to a big group of ours about marketing cause he does that so well and taking care of his clientele so well. And, uh, <laughs> And come to find out that uh, Rod has a lot of uh, expertise and experience in uh, in social justice and working on these causes anyway. And for real estate rock stars, I think we would be remiss in not addressing uh, what's going on out there today with respect to real estate and also just in our communities because the real estate community is a huge community. So, um you know, actually, Rod, if you could tell us about your real estate practice, just so that we have a sense of, uh, so that the viewers uh, have a sense of, of, of who you are and what you do. Yeah. So again, my name is Rod Watson. Um, I'm the CEO and uh, director of sports and entertainment at the LAVIP agent, uh, LAVIP agent team in, in Beverly Hills at, at uh, KW Beverly Hills. Uh, we focus primarily on sports and entertainment professionals as athletes, NBA, NFL, uh, and then also entertainers in the industry of sports and entertainment. Uh, we assist them primarily with uh, development of their real estate portfolio. So if they're looking to invest in real estate, whether that's um, multifamily, single family, uh, hotels, uh, commercial, I have a wealth of experience in those spaces. I've been in the business now 14 years. It's my passion as a former athlete, you know, played uh uh, high school, collegially, and then professionally overseas for a few years, and also coached in college. So, majority of my life, young, young, young uh, adolescence and adulthood has been revolved around sports and being involved in that industry, heavily developing relationships. So, I saw it only to be fitting. Once I got into real estate, I, I, I learned that you know, building a brand is one of the most important and valuable things you can do. Um, especially in niche markets, and I started in distressed sales, and then transitioned right into sports and entertainment because it was only natural with the relationships that I had developed and the people I've grown to know over the years that, hey, they invest in, they, they buy properties and they also do that regularly. So that's, that's, that's the area that I focus on. And it's, it's, like I said, it's one of my passions and I'm very committed to this uh, space and I've been working to build a, a brand and a reputation since I've started 14 years ago. Rockstar Nation, this is Aaron Muchastegui. Hey, I hate to interrupt the current podcast that you're listening to, but I am so excited to share this with you. I just finished interviewing the original host of this podcast, my good friend, Pat Hyben. Now, I got to talk to Pat about how he started his real estate career and a whole bunch of tips and tactics that he used to be successful. So if you haven't listened to it yet, go check out State of the Market number 49 on there. I get to talk to Pat about all those different things. You know, and in there too, he talked a lot about his six steps for seven figures book and training program that he built 
over the last couple of years. And I realized I haven't done a good enough job of reminding all of you lately about all of the resources that we've built for you out there. So if you want to check out Pat's course, we've got like a three minute summary video when you go to it. It includes so many easy to follow tips that you can follow on like a day to day basis. You get email reminders, all sorts of different things that come with that course. You find that you go to rebusuniversity.com, R-E-B-U-S, rebusuniversity.com. Look at courses. You can find the six steps for seven figures book. And really there's a whole bunch of other courses in there too. Our normal prices used to be $1,500 or $2,000 a course. These are real deal professional courses. But now look, during quarantine, a lot of them are priced down like 90 bucks, 95 bucks. So we've slashed the prices so we know right now is the time for everybody to be focusing on growth and education, especially while they're feeling like you don't have as much to do. And if you go in there and you figure like, like there's a lot of different courses you want, maybe you don't want to buy the a la carte. You can go to futureofrealestatetraining.com and you can get access to all of our different courses for 97 bucks a month. I think there's a discount on there if you go a year or there's even like a lifetime option you can pay to get access to every course we've ever put on Rebus University for as long as we have it. So go check out those options, Rebus University or futureofrealestatetraining.com. All right, back to your podcast. Sorry for the interruption. One of the things that, that uh, um, you know, there is a great overlap I think there's great potential overlap between uh, what's going on now today and some opportunities that we have as realtors. Um, you know, it's really it's really always been a big part of the American dream is home ownership. So Correct. I think that that talking to uh, talking to a large group of realtors, we we have a, a tremendous follow up following on this podcast of realtors of of you know all over the country. Uh, every race, race, ethnicity, uh, everything. What can we do? Uh, what do you think we can do as realtors um, to differentiate ourselves from the pack and, and, and contribute to the healing uh, that we have an opportunity to do? Well, I, I think it starts with awareness, really understanding, you know, regardless of where you are in the world, we all play a part in uh, bringing about change. And I always use this message, be the change you want to see in the world first. Start by, you know, really, like I said, doing your research, reaching out, having empathy, uh, communicating with those that, you know, may not look like you or do not, you know, uh, live in the communities or reside where you live or, or share the same background and experiences, but have an open mind about engaging and educating yourself about what you can do first. And um, I think for us as uh, agents uh, across the world or, or just here in the United States, one of the biggest things, you know, as you see these things unfolding before your eyes, you may have relationships with Black people or, or people of color um, that you value and that you've invested in. But however, ask yourself, what more can I do? You know, how, how deeper can I develop these relationships? What, what can I do with the power that I possess and that I hold? as an agent to inform, educate, and empower this demographic or these demographics of Black people or people of color, primarily Blacks, because we know that a lot of Black people have faced injustice, uh, disenfranchisement, have been denied access to wealth. So with those relationships that you may currently have or carry, how can you plug individuals in that are, are, are uh, in position or are are seeking information to empower them, to help them take advantage of the opportunities that are before us when it comes to developing and building wealth through real estate. I think the biggest thing is just caring, you know, caring enough to say, hey, even though I'm comfortable, even though I may live in a good community, even though I may have a million or a hundred thousand dollars in the bank, there are other people that are out there that have been denied the opportunity to live and pursue, to have a pursuit of happiness and, and opportunities to grow wealth and build it. And a lot of them lack information and knowledge. So I think a lot of it starts around caring and then being a tool or a vessel, if you will, to start connecting those dots and doing what you can within your communities or your organizations and, and, and with the individuals you have relationships with to inform, educate, and empower. Mm -hmm. And I wonder just on that front of, of, you know, having awareness. Um, I've learned a lot, you know, I've learned a lot in the last couple of weeks, uh, for sure. And I wonder what, what can you share with us your experience um, as a black man getting into a high end luxury real estate, uh, real estate practice? What, what, uh, what was your experience barriers you had to overcome? What was easier, harder, yeah. different? Well, I'll start by first saying this to get no matter what color you are to get into to get into real estate at the luxury level is very challenging. It's very hard. 
It can be very clicky. Um, oftentimes that demographic is controlled by white males and often in that demographic are older white males. And a lot of these individuals come from wealth or have those strong relationships and ties. So now when you take that into being someone that's black, it's even more challenging because there are fewer of us that even have been able to obtain that level of wealth that is required to even own a multi-million dollar property or portfolio of, of assets. And so for me, I found it to be very challenging, one, because I didn't know people in that background outside of athletes that had money and that were capable of affording a million dollar or seven million dollar you know, property, multi-million dollar property. And the other thing that I faced was um, when being in companies, there was a lack of diversity. And I um, I remember just one hand, I won't name the, name the company or the individual, but, you know, the same ideas that I have been working to present to you, Paul, I had, I've i always been a forward thinking individual and I've had a business plan and, I, and I'm very goal oriented because I've, I've, I've developed those skill sets as an athlete in my years of being involved in sports. And I wanted to present um, these, you know, my vision to the founder of the company, he ignored me for two years after having a sit down face to face meeting. And, you know, I, I, I took that personally, but I also had to learn that, you know, everything starts at the top where, you know, individuals in these companies uh, or agents that are in this space really wanting to care. And I think there's just been this culture where there has been this divide and this gap where uh, there's a lack of empathy and it's really a primary focus on just taking care of us and ourselves and our and our families and the way we do business and keeping those that don't look like us out, whether it be intentionally, whether it be unintentionally, that has become the culture, that has become the norm that a lot of these uh, privately held companies or even publicly held real estate companies, when you're talking about being at the top from a luxury standpoint. And also begin to see that there is a direct intent of keeping us out just on my personal experiences. I don't have to dive deep into, you know, going into naming names, but I've been at several of the top companies from Pacific Sotheby's, Compass, Douglas Elman. Um, you know, I was recently at Rebel Real Estate. Um, and those are considered to be some of the top companies when you talk about luxury. And one of the primary things I saw was a strong lack of diversity and a caring need or even a want to see more diversity within those companies, particularly when you start talking about luxury. And I find that to be a lug the luxury real estate to be a very competitive space. Like I said, it's it's hard enough just being, you know, a white person. I think others can can attest to this uh, in being in this space, let alone being someone that's black. So, you know, there are very few of us at the top. And I, I found that that leadership when I was at these companies really didn't care to engage or even to provide information or access on how we can grow in this space and how we can develop and build our businesses. The feeling I always receive is that you're not welcome here and this isn't for you. So, you know, those have been my experiences thus far prior to coming to KW Beverly Hills. Well, I appreciate that. And, uh, and, you know, I have to say that, you know, knowing, knowing you, uh, from work a, a, a couple of years ago and then you, you know the reputation of what you built in such a small period of time and now having the opportunity again uh you know here's a message to the other ceos and other uh other other folks in those decision making places and that is your loss because um you know if people would have been more open to rod's ideas maybe he wouldn't we wouldn't have had that opportunity now i don't want that to be the case um, but it's certainly, I could certainly say to other company owners, there is an advantage waiting for you, uh, just to have open eyes and ears to, to, uh, ideas from, from, from all different sorts of people. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. And I appreciate, I appreciate you stay making that statement and saying that I felt welcome. You know, even when I met you in, in a couple of years ago and we sat and had our conversations, I, I looked at you someone as more of a leader and and and, to, and not just someone that's just, hey, I'm here to, you know, um, house licenses for agents and make money off agents. I really saw you as someone that genuinely cared and, and, and had a wealth of information that could be passed down. I just wasn't in a place at that point where I felt comfortable because of my previous experiences at bigger companies and the way I was treated. It, it really honestly caused me to be more jaded. And I think for a year and a half, I went out on my own and I just stuck to myself and built my business that way because I was fearful. Of, I had went through so many situations where I've been torn down and it, it was getting frustrating. And so therefore I was more reserved and less, less open to even being in a bigger company because I just didn't want to go through those experiences anymore. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah. I'm going to, I just want to jump in for a second. And the, so Rod, you said you've been in real estate, was it 14 years? Yes, that's correct. And then when you first got started, the, did you go right into this kind of luxury niche? No, Cause I mean, no, you talked about how hard no. it was to get into, how did no, you, how did you tr- make that transition? When I first started, I started out as an investor. I, I learned how to buy properties. My wife and I, we did rehabs and we, we sold and you know, we held and put tenants in our properties. That's how I first got started solely as an investor. And then my wife got licensed. And once I got my license, what brought me into the business is that I truly wanted to help people. I saw that the market was turning. I got into business when it was going to crap in 2008. Nobody wanted to be in the business. And I saw that doing short sales and handling REOs was my opportunity to break in and really learn the investment side and also being in a position to help people. Um, And then once I saw that market changing after working in it for almost uh, eight or nine years, I began to see that there was an immense amount of opportunity in the sports and entertainment space because I had one client who was a good friend of mine at the time. and He played for the Houston Rockets and he needed to sell his property. And, um, you know, he had he had shared his experiences with me that he had had with other agents that didn't look like me as far as how they handled him and how they dealt with his business and the way they made him feel. And I, and I and immediately a light switch went off, just like it did when short sales was coming around. And this is a niche market that I knew I could thrive and do well in. Um, and that majority of the clients that I was going to serve looked like me. And, they, and I understood where they came from and what they went through. So at that very point point in 2011, really 2010 is why I said, you know, I think this is a career path I can really lock into and do well. And it still took me about three or four years after that acknowledgement and and just becoming more aware to start locking in and developing a brand for myself, meaning really building out uh, my name and, and developing my relationships even more so that I had with my current friends and associates. And then, you know, really um, trying to figure out ways to connect really i think that's really what it what it comes down to is making meaningful connections and once i figured out how to effectively do that the rest was history i just stay focused from that point and uh just you know really went all in on building my brand out and uh making sure that you know people knew who i was and knew knew what i was able to do when it came to providing a service to them um and and from that point on I, i've never looked back and that was like i said around 2010 and here we are a decade later my brand, I feel like, is one of the most um, recognizable brands in this space. And I've done a, a, an immense amount of body of work that very few people do in a lifetime in a short period of time. You know, something Paul said at the beginning when you talked about the, the, the guys that you were working with that didn't give you credit, it's like their loss, right? Correct. Like the, it's, it, you, found, you did the same thing with your, with your niche, really. Right. Yeah, like yeah. your clients were people that weren't getting treated the way they were supposed to get treated. And it, be, and it, and you were able yeah. to say, Hey, Hey, that's their loss. The, yeah. I'm, I'm going to do everything I can, you know, for my clients. Absolutely. It took me, you know, even going through those experiences, I'm thankful because what it did is it showed me, first of all, everything's about timing. Right. I also had to learn that don't take everything personal. And this business is super competitive. And often, oftentimes it's more territorial and when you're dealing with wealth and mass amounts of money, uh, you know, people, people, you know, they take that seriously. And you know, there are a lot of individuals that are in this field, primarily in the luxury space that have been doing it for years and they've developed a lot of relationships. And so for me, when I was being treated like that in those companies, I said, just be patient. You're going to find your place. You're going to find out, you're going to find a place that's going to value what you're doing. Just keep building, keep working on perfecting your craft, keep working on providing value to the clients that you serve. And one day everyone's going to know your name and they're going to know what you've done in this space. So that's that became my focus rather than focusing on what had been done to me and how I had been treated. As you stated, I looked at it more as their loss. And one day these companies are going to realize they made a huge mistake in treating me the way that they did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And one more and then, sorry, Paul, I'll no, no, back right over with the, you know, at the, at Rod, one of the first things you said when we said like, what can we do today? What can everyone do today to try to fix things? And you said it was, you know, inform, educate and empower. Right. Mm-hmm. And, the, and, the, and I can say, I think every, you know, so many people over the last, you know, week have been educating themselves, you know, the, Absolutely. you know, they're being forced to educate themselves and forced to question and people are becoming brave and sharing stories. And then it's helping inspire others to go like, wow, I really never saw that sort of perspective. So the inform and educate to me seems like a, a, a simple equation, right? Yes. It's like, this is what you empower is that hard one. 
right? Mm-hmm. So that's like the next step. So the next step is the, you know, first we need to become aware. Everyone needs to become aware so we can make change and then empower. What advice would you give to somebody that says, hey, I want to empower someone or what could someone have done for you earlier on uh, in your career or what are you trying to do out there that really helps empower people? Well, I'll give you an example. You know, I sat down with Paul a couple of years ago and he asked me a question. He was like, do you, are you comfortable with having an unfair competitive advantage? And at first I was like, what the hell is this guy talking about? And it took me, uh, you know, a while and I understood it that we all possess a gift. You know, we all possess, you know, superpowers, if you will. Paul's uniqueness is that he had the ability to share with individuals how to build wealth. You know, he, he possessed that, that, that ability from his experience and his knowledge. And I think when you talk about empowering, um, it's that moment that Paul sat down and he, he took time to explain to me that I had a unique skill set and a different gift than most individuals that, that look like me or even operate in the field that I'm operating in. And, and I had to embrace it and, and harness that and really dive and lean into that and, and be okay with having that unfair competitive advantage, but using that in a positive way to empower, meaning the athletes that I serve, uh, even though they have money, they have no clue about investing. Most of them, a large majority of them, are how money works when it comes to investing in real estate, how and how to structure deals, how to structure those deals in a position where it's beneficial to them, because oftentimes they're led into situations that are not beneficial for them. It's beneficial for those that are making money off of them. So by giving them some, not just giving them the information, but showing them how to utilize the information you're empowering them to then take that information and use it in a use it to their benefit, use it in their benefit to grow wealth, use it to their benefit to um, make change within their communities for themselves and for their families. And I think when you talk about empowering, it's just that it's get, being comfortable enough to sit down with someone or to share with a group of individuals. This is how you build wealth. This is how you grow your real estate portfolio. This is how you make changes within your lives. Um, with this information and and then being comfortable to allow them to go and figure that out or either giving them the steps and the guidance to figure it out to whether they are in a position now to live a better life and to create opportunity for others that look like them or people that they serve or people that are within their community. So when you talk about empowerment, that's, that's how I look at it. I think it's just about when you possess the ability to make change when you have that information or you have access to it and you're willing to share it, we call it passing the plug where I come from. That means being able to pass that opportunity of knowledge or wealth of information on to the next without any strings attached or trying to exploit someone or take advantage of someone um, and lead them in a situation that may not be beneficial to them. Empowerment is just that, giving someone else the power to do great things and to, and to be able to build on that. That's super cool. And thanks for, thanks for reminding me of that, of that, uh, that moment we had, which is really cool. Uh, we, oh, yeah, I never had, forget it. Yeah. And well, you know what, we'll, we're going to, we're going to uh, take it to the next step for sure. Oh yeah. Uh, Rockstar nation. This is Aaron Muchastegui. Hey, I hate to interrupt the current podcast that you're listening to, but I am so excited to share this with you. I just finished interviewing the original host of this podcast, my good friend, Pat Hyman. Yeah, I got to talk to Pat about how he started his real estate career and a whole bunch of tips and tactics that he used to be successful. So if you haven't listened to it yet, go check out State of the Market number 49. On there, I get to talk to Pat about all those different things. You know, and in there too, he talked a lot about his six steps for seven figures book and training program that he built over the last couple of years. And I realized I haven't done a good enough job of reminding all of you lately about all of the resources that we've built for you out there. So if you want to check out Pat's course, we've got like a three minute summary video when you go to it. It includes so many easy to follow tips that you can follow on it like a day to day basis. You get email reminders, all sorts of different things that come with that course. You find that you go to rebusuniversity.com, R-E-B-U-S, rebusuniversity.com. Look at courses. You can find the six steps for seven figures book. And really there's a whole bunch of other courses in there too. Our normal prices used to be $1,500 or $2,000 a course. These are real deal professional courses. But now uh, during quarantine, a lot of them are priced down like 90 bucks, 95 bucks. So we slashed the prices to we know right now is the time for everybody who's focusing on growth and education, especially while they're feeling like they don't have as much to do. And if you go in there and you figure like, like there's a lot of different courses you want, maybe you don't want to buy the a la carte. You can go to futureofrealestatetraining.com. 
and you can get access to all of our different courses for 97 bucks a month. I think there's a discount on there if you go a year or there's even like a lifetime option you can pay to get access to every course we've ever put on Rebus University for as long as we have it. So go check out those options, Rebus University or futureofrealestatetraining.com. All right, back to your podcast. Sorry for the interruption. One of, uh, uh, we, I interviewed, a, one thing I love about the podcast, of course, is we get to talk to, you know, gives me the opportunity to have a chat with super smart people like Rod and their different areas. And, and, and it is something that I talk about uh, with realtors and people all the time is identify your superpower. Uh, I did an interview with, uh, with a guy who sells real estate in Bel Air uh, named Jeffrey Sod. I did it real estate rock stars uh, uh, podcast. And one of the things that, that, that uh, Jeffrey said was, the upside of your upside is always greater than the upside of your downside. And that's just, to me, that's a cool different way of saying, hey, work on your superpowers, figure mm -hmm. out what you're great at and work mm -hmm. on it. When I talk to real estate rock stars community, I know that this community, uh, they know real estate. And probably what they know is they know real estate in their area the best. And sometimes we undervalue that thing that we know so well. And, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna tell you from my experience doing masterminds, with very high net worth people, much wealthier than me, I was always shocked that, and I'm taking this back to your, back to your uh, athlete, uh, 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 talking about helping athletes. So even super wealthy people in certain areas of their life, I was shocked to know how, to figure out how little they know about other areas. So let's say I've got a super wealthy uh, friend in that mastermind that did a product development uh, two guys I can think of that do product development. So they took a product from, you know, zero to selling their company for a couple hundred million dollars. And it's over a lifetime and doing all that business. And yet you'd be, I was shocked to know that they know absolutely nothing about real estate and nothing yeah. about real estate investing. They know nothing about the stock market, you know, and then we got the guys in the group that are like stock market experts and they know nothing about products. They know nothing <laughs> about real estate. So, you know, yeah. even these people, they're such smart business people. They don't understand the areas that, and, and, and it's, it is a form of wisdom to say, Hey, I don't know this and I'm going to go to an expert. So to all the people that are real estate rock stars that are listening, one of the things that you can do just in your business in general is make sure to view your superpower as I have massive market knowledge beyond what other people know about this small area. And I can use that yes. to help people invest in their wealth. And, and, um, and I'll Absolutely. say this, um, you, you know, one of the questions that, uh, that, that Aaron asked was, you know, what can we do? And then there's, you know, there's awareness and then, and then, and, and but, the, but the last step was empowerment. And one of the things that I've thought about, I mentioned it to you just while we were texting, getting ready for this uh, interview is I, you know, I'm sitting around and I'm thinking, I always want to bring an action step to the table because we can listen to this podcast and be like, yes, wow, I've got awareness. Now this is cool. But what do we do next? And so I'm going to tell you what I'm doing in, in my company is implementing something called the Rooney rule. And, uh, and it comes from the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, you know, I'm from Pittsburgh, so I like that. Um, but what the Rooney rule is, is it's a NFL league policy that requires league leagues, the league teams to interview ethnic minority candidates for head coaching and senior football operations jobs. And what's, what's, I find very interesting about it. It's not a hiring quota. It is not even affirmative action. Okay. All it says is you have to have a minority in the mix. And one of the things that happens with me is when I'm out looking for senior uh, positions, and I just say this from my own experience, I, I look around my, my team, I go, hey, why aren't there more African-Americans on my team? Why aren't there more minorities on my team? And then and the real true answer is like, oh, well, hey, I interviewed four people and I just didn't have an African-American in the, in the mix, you know? What this does is it forces you, it would force me, so I'm talking about just myself, it would force me to look a little harder, look a little mm -hmm. further, reach mm -hmm. a little further, and then mm -hmm. just look at all the candidates equally and take the best one that's there. Now I've got five candidates. One of them's, one of them's uh, African-American, four of them are not. At least I have it in the mix. And that over time has created change in the NFL. And that's something I can start that. I can start, and I plan to. I already talked to my business partners. I'm going to start that on Monday morning. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I, I like that. I, um, and, you know, in addition to what you're stating as far as the question, 
when the question's asked, and sorry I didn't ask, answer that, but I would. this is what I would add in on top of what Paul is sharing is that whether it's the Rooney, Rooney rule or whether you're you're really taking a step back and looking at the culture within your companies, it goes back to what I'm saying, you know, educate, ask questions and really take a look at what is the culture? What have I fostered? You know, what have I developed? You know, what is our company like? If we have a lack of diversity, that starts at the top and, it's, and, and the top has to have enough con- awareness and compassion to say, all right, what can we implement to bring about change that's going to create opportunities, that's going to allow us to engage? Because there are a lot of talented Black people out there in, in, in various uh, positions that carry uh, just as much knowledge and a wealth of in- income and can bring value to companies. And I feel like for so long, we've been devalued just simply because it's, it's, <clears throat> it, 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 it has become the norm for a lot of companies from a cultural standpoint to exclude us. And um, very few people are afraid to ask questions or to make that change because of the fear of being ostracized or being looked at differently um, by their peers or receiving a lack of support, whether it's from their donors or whether it's from their investors. And I think what you have to first say is, what is our culture? What do we stand for? And, you know, Paul, you're, you're, taking, you're taking the lead in basically stating that, hey, I see the necessary change and these are the actionable steps we're going to take. And as you shared, it starts with, questioning, you know, uh, you know, taking a deep look within and saying, all right, I see these problems are here. I see these things that need to be addressed. And this is how we're going to address them and make that announcement company wide and then put action behind it. And, you know, and I, I see that as a first step. It's, it's not the end of the journey uh, for Absolutely. me, my company at all, but I'm, I was like, I, I want to do something other than other than raise awareness, which I know is so important, and have these conversations where so like, what is what's one action step I could do right now? And that one's so easy, you know. Correct. We don't have an opening right now, right? As soon as we do, that that's going to be in play. Um, yeah. So well, it, the so, other so the other thing to that too is is that you know companies, businesses, um, institutions can look within and say, who do we already have that's here that may be being overlooked yes. that we have not either acknowledged or properly promoted or put them in positions that they truly deserve because we see a lot of politics, regardless of whether it's banking, whether it's real estate, whether it's private equity, whether it's technology, whether it's, you know, development, business, et cetera. We see a lot of politics within these industries where individuals at the top are putting people oftentimes into positions of leadership or power that really haven't either earned it or do not possess the necessary skill sets to be leaders or to truly bring value. It's based upon a relationship, someone you know, et cetera. And I think if, if, if we take a step back and really look at that and say, are we putting the best people in position of power? Are we putting the best people in these positions to lead our companies? And it, should, and it shouldn't solely just be on the color of someone's skin. However, that has become the way of life for us here in America. And I think across the world, when we talk about being in positions of leadership, we really have to look within and say, who have we overlooked? Because I think within companies, institutions, businesses, et cetera, there are people there and they may not be black. Maybe they're Latino, maybe they're Asian, maybe they're you know Middle Eastern. However, they're people of color or some other form of diversity outside of being white. The companies need, companies, institutions need to take a step back and look and say, who do we already have that's here that may have been overlooked or haven't been given these opportunities and then put actionable steps in place to ensure that those opportunities are given. Yeah. So Rod, the, for a lot of our real estate rock stars listeners out there right now, the, you know, one of the articles that came on Inman yesterday or day before, it said, this is not a time for marketing as usual. Right. And it was telling your real estate agents like, Hey, you can't go do your normal marketing, you Correct. Can't go do this in building your business. And so right now, do you think that the, and a lot of agents, a lot of our listeners do a ton of stuff on social media saying, Hey, I'm listing this house. Hey, I'm doing the very, you know, promote themselves very well. Mm-hmm. So the, would you say right now, while everything's happening, should they completely take a break from social media? If not, what is the way that they can market their business properly? You know, I, I don't know the right way to ask it, but it's like people are trying to figure out like, hey, do I just not do anything on social media right now or not? Because, you yeah. know, the, yeah, I, I don't, I, you know, what do you think about that? Yeah, I don't, I don't think someone should stop. I think business does need to carry on. I think as long as they're aware and, and, and sensitive to what's going on around them and they're doing their part to engage and make a change or be a part of the solution, um, I don't think someone should stop marketing or doing business, uh, or sorry, marketing on, on the internet or doing business. Maybe there are certain things they need to be cautious or aware of as far as their messaging and what they're putting out. 
But I think people can be, be creative and be unique in their marketing to show support, you know, as far as uh, unity and solidarity, as far as addressing and dealing racism in our society. However, from a business standpoint, we still have we still have to try and, you know, provide for ourselves and our families, regardless of what we look like or where we're from. Um, I think as a real estate community, um, the more that we show we are in support of what's going on, um, I think that brings a lot more visibility and transparency, transparency to the fact that um, our, our industry is very diverse. And if we can show unity within our and within our industry, I think we can be a part of leading the change on the forefront, because think about how many people own homes and reside in properties. Right. A play a home is a safe haven for a lot of people right now and has been for the last several months because we've all been locked inside of our homes. And I think that 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 brings an opportunity for agents to have the discussions about what's going on. And on top of that, some of the changes that people may be making in the near future in regards to where they reside, um, you know, how they live uh, and answering questions around um, our industry and in particular when it comes to home ownership and, and guiding those that may not have access uh, to the to the information that can lead them to wealth building. So I don't think we should stop marketing in any any way. I think we have to find more creative ways to market that 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 are impactful. Um, mm -hmm. If you feel led, if you feel led to do so, that that provide value to the audience. I think that's the most important thing that in the past, a lot of the marketing is just kind of like just put out, put out. I think if you can really go to a value based marketing strategy, you're going to have more success, especially during a time like right now than ever before. So I think it's just harnessing the opportunity and really challenging, 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 uh, channeling your your efforts and energy into the message that you're putting out. And I think it should be a value based message. Yeah, I've seen, you know, we've seen some big companies saying, you know, some people are saying, hey, some big companies are posting on social media or sending out letters on their websites just saying, hey, we hear you and we understand what's going on. Other people are saying, hey, we hear you and we're standing with you. Uh, other people are saying, we're standing with you and here's some action that we're going to take, you know, like, Correct. like Paul's example. You know, I think there's three different versions of that. Correct. And I think, and I think what you're saying is people are going to find w what stage they're in right? Like everyone's stages are going to be a little bit different, but if first, but first, like, don't just be quiet, say something, right. say whatever your acknowledgement is, wherever, wherever you're at in that stage, because yeah, everybody's allowed to be wherever they are in their stage. And then being able to figure out a way to be, you know, creative with that, you know, and yeah. the, and, 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 it, and figuring out that, yes, I mean, we're already coming out of this, Hey, you know, quarantine is starting to be over. We want real estate agents to go back into business, back into the boom. And then there's this, so being able just yeah. to acknowledge, wow, this is what's crazy, yeah. what's going on. We're still trying to do this, this, and this, you know, during uh, quarantine, you know, Paul and I would talk a lot about, you know, uh, Paul seemed doing the I care message, right? It was calling people and not saying, Hey, I want to buy your house. I want to sell your house. I want to help you. It was just saying, Hey, do you need anything? Yeah. Um, oh yeah. Do, that's do, one do, of the messages. That's one of the messages I carry. I got away from more or less chasing and, and the commission breath type sales to when I talk to people, I was, I'm like, here, I'm here to provide value. And is there anything I can do to help you at this time? Case in point, if I call a seller on an expired, rather than just calling and say, hey, when is the next time you the interview? And I can say, hey, you know, our company is one of the leaders in the industry and in helping people um, build and develop wealth. And, you know, I'm just reaching out because we've had some success in your neighborhood and want to see if there's anything I can do to help you at this current time. And if there is, I'd love to, you know, have a 15, 20 minute conversation with you on how we can assist you. Is there anything you currently need help with at the time? That leads into a whole different conversation because when you use the word help, then people are like, hmm, let me think about that. No, I don't, I don't need anything at the moment. And then that that opens up the opportunity for dialogue to say, hey, well, perhaps I can follow up with you at a later date and time. Or or we offer these these services in form in a form of value, you know, from a value-based you know, strategy and, and, and people are going to remember that they're going to be more willing to be engaged with that conversation than the 99th agent that's called them about selling their property, especially during a time right now, like, like right now. Yeah. So it seems like the, I, the, I care message and outreach is, is as applicable or more applicable today yeah. you know, as it was a month or two ago. Did exactly. It exactly. I think we have to be willing to evolve in our, in our, in our, um, in our industry, right? And, and as you said, you know, the, the I care, I think when you show that you care and you genuinely, um, you know, put people's needs first, uh, that separates you immediately from the, from the masses because what the masses are typically being taught is just go after the deal, go after the transaction, 
And I've learned to change up my approach, you know, almost a decade ago as far as how I engage with people. And I think in a, in, in a market like we're in right now with all of the changes and everything that's going on, regardless if you're in the luxury sector or if you're the first time home buyer, everything goes back to how you treat people and how you deal with people. And so if you can really base your message around value and what it is you can do to help people and what it is you can do to play your part in making this world a better place, making our industry a better place, I would go all in on that because I believe you're going to have more success with that during a time like right now, regardless if you're selling $50 million properties or you're selling $500,000 $500, properties, you're, gonna, you're going to resonate with people that are sensitive to the moment right now and the situation. And those are going to be the people ultimately you're going to want to attract and want to work with long term. But I love the, uh, you know, uh, one of the things, sort of an update to uh, to the eye care message was, um, you know, I was advocating an eye care message so that people, realtors could stand out as vendors, um, uh, could could stand out as leaders in the time where initially in COVID we were just in shock, you know. So they're saying put the economy on hold, hit the pause button. We're in shock, and then I look at my phone and I'm like. Huh. The only incoming message I'm getting are from uh, family members and my closest business colleagues. And I don't blame anybody else because that that's what's natural. People are freaked out, you know, but you could be a real like, you know, my chiropractor actually is one that was texting me, you know, but other than him, I'm like, it's crickets, you know, and, and I know people do care. So I was saying, hey, you can stand out by by reaching out at that point in time. Now, I have I've changed my eye care message, by the way, because now we're looking at, hey, let's restart the economy. Now it's like, hey, you know, hope your your family's safe and, and you know, let me know if you have any questions on real estate or whatever, you know, I mean, we would do a better sure. um, you know, as a way, uh, as a way to do it. So I've morphed from eye care, definitely a value. And I think Broad's point too about value marketing. People are not interested in, in you know, unless they happen to be interested in that one particular house that you are marketing you're wasting marketing time and energy rather than saying like, Hey, I've got this house. And by the way, here's the, here's what I can do. Here's here are the things I offer, you know? So I think your value marketing message works in any time and we can absolutely part through that for sure. I agree. I agree. 100%. Rod, how many, how many deals did you do last year? Do you know what your, what your GC We did 13. Was? We did 13 and it's funny. We did 13 and we, we did almost 14 million off that 13. All right. And his pipeline, I know I well looked at your pipeline's insane, right? Yeah, we got um we've got almost a hundred million in our pipeline right now. And that's from deals from just that didn't close last year or new deals that we brought in and listings that, you know, it's five, five I have five, including myself, there's five of us on my team. So I've got two young rock star agents that are doing really well. One has a fifty million dollar listing and they and, and their partners, Jake and Enzo those young guys one's 21 one's 28 and that's the other thing i i've i've learned early in this career it's important to invest in the young and the millennial generation i believe is being ignored um primarily by the real estate industry um but you know one of the things i noticed at kw beverly hills is that they are definitely making those investments into the younger younger agents and so that was another reason why i chose to align my my brand with kw beverly hills because i felt they understood and, and they're getting it right and so, um, yeah, you know, we're, we're excited about the future and, and we're, we're working hard and diligently to provide value to the clients we serve. So we built up a really nice pipeline and our goal is 57 million this, this for our full fiscal year coming back around June 1st next time this year. So we're on track to hit that goal. And I, I'm really excited about it, especially with the leadership we have in you, Paul and, and Josh, to help us stay on track and provide value along the way. And I'm. You guys have those guys on your team close that big one. You're going to hit those numbers, <laughs> those yeah, numbers know, right? pretty easily, man. <laughs> Real quick. <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm definitely, definitely yep. interested in and uh, invested in in doing that side by side, uh, shoulder shoulder to shoulder with you. One of the things that that uh, Rod was talking to me about, and and there's this thing, there's this thing called uh, 360 degree leadership. It's it's uh, a John Maxwell book, but the idea of it is that you you uh, as a leader you know, we always think about, well, Rod is the CEO of his, of his, uh, of his team and his company. So we think about Rod's leadership would be like, okay, so he's going to lead the people on his team. Right. But then that's usual leadership. Then there's, there's lateral leadership where Rod is going to lead and teach agents 
of his own level. And, and the way that he can do that is just lead by example. Right. Um, and then leadership, then there's leadership up. So I will tell you that being back in business with Rod, you know, he's leading, he's leading me. So, you know, if you think that you cannot do that because you're a single agent in some firm or whatever, you absolutely can do that. He was giving yeah. leadership opportunity to the people where he was and they weren't listening. Okay. So, mm-hmm. so I'm listening. One of the things that, that Rod did was to, okay, Hey Paul, let's, let's do some, let's use your superpower. Right. And, and that's, 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 uh, that's combine that with mine. And that's, uh, that's talk about wealth building to some of the, some of the, uh, some of the folks that he's marketing his homes to. So that's a win for him. It's a win for me. Um, another thing I was just thinking Absolutely. about is, and you know, this is a challenge for us, Rod, that we, you know, that we could take. And that is, it's another thing you can do. Um, I, I taught entrepreneurship to minorities uh, in Washington, DC, when I was in Washington, DC. Now I'm going to tell you how, that's a true statement. Now I'm going to tell you how it really happened. How it really happened was <laughs> there was an agency, right? There was yeah. an agency that said, hey, we need volunteers that will teach, uh, that will tutor, not the kids that are slow in class, but the kids that are the top of the class in very underprivileged areas because they're not getting enough attention with all the too many kids in the classroom. So yeah. so that's what I raised. So it was already in place. I raised my hand for that. And they go, okay, well, what are you going to teach? You're going to teach English. You're going to teach math. You're gonna I'm like, okay, wait a minute. I'll teach math. Then I get, then I get these kids in front of me and I'm going to try and teach them math. But I'm like, oh, it's boring especially at the end of the day. So then I started putting it in the context of a business, like, Hey, what kind of business do you want? Does anybody want to run a business? And one kid said, yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, 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 a uh, ticketing, you know, like, like um, a promoter, you know, like, Oh, I want to be a, I want to be a, a music promoter. I'm like, okay, well that's, that's like, let's do the math on that. You know, and so I created a whole word problem with it. Maybe we, maybe you and I could teach wealth building to, to kids it would really that that would really resonate with that. That's absolutely. another action step that would be phenomenal. Yeah, absolutely. I I, I fully support that because I believe uh, financial literacy, um, not just in the black community, but I think across the board in American society, is something that's not taught in schools, which I think is a travesty. Because outside of the information that kids spend hours upon hours learning in secondary and college institutions, very little of that is p- applied in in American society. You know, and we have to leave these institutions after graduate from college or finishing high school and figure out how we're going to support ourselves and how we're going to make money. And I think a part of uh, making that change, especially in the black community, is, is really harnessing and, and, and leaning into uh, providing access to financial literacy. And a lot of kids don't have access to that. They come from broken families financially, uh, emotionally. Um, and, and that's that's something that is very rarely discussed. So I'm all in for those types of uh empowerment solutions that can provide value back to that back to the african-american community or people of color who choose to engage because you know it doesn't get any easier for us out here in society as as individuals regardless of what color you are things cost more money um and you have to be able to figure out how to provide for yourself and i think that that's value that's a real value-based opportunity that be that would be offered for those kids and those families that want to learn how to be business owners and investors because at the end of the day that's the that is the real access to wealth and that, that's access to wealth and true freedom true freedom mm-hmm. and so my challenge to uh to our our listeners is you know we're doing this podcast to build awareness there's a lot of other ways you can build awareness Absolutely. Um, and my, my challenge is to create some action step that you can do. And, uh, I'm, I'm going to implement the Rooney rule as a step one. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to make, uh, I'm going to make noise with it. Okay. So that, so that we're like, Hey, look at us, we're doing this. And then maybe our competitors will go like, Oh, geez, we don't want to be left behind. If they do want to be yeah. left behind, then they're left behind. And exactly. otherwise, you know, then I get to lead my co co uh, owners, you know, owners in, in different brands, even to say, Hey, that's what they're doing over here. We got to do that over here, uh, over there, let's go over here. So, so, uh, hopeful in, in, in either case. Um, and Rod, you are, uh, you're a board member on the, on, on the, uh, people's Alliance. justice, right? That's right. Yeah. Tell us about that. And then what are some ways that our listeners can help? And one of the things that we're going to do, uh, Aaron, is we'll put up uh, we'll put up links for uh, places where people can get resources to get in the conversation and also to help out. 
Yeah. Well, yeah. first off, the People's Alliance for Justice was founded by Reverend Shane Harris about two years ago. He init initially, Reverend Shane Harris was under the National Action Network with Reverend Al Sharpton, where he got he, he received mentorship and guidance from Reverend Al. And then um, at you know, I, I think he was in that position for like four or five years. I met him when he was 23. He, he, he was, you know, kind of midway through his experience and, and learning process and mentorship there under Reverend Al. And uh, he was more or less the West Coast director. And then, you know, Shane, uh, after being under that mentorship, uh, him and I discussed, you know, launching, um, you know, his own foundation and the People's Alliance for Justice, the name that he came up with. Uh, Shane has been uh, very diligent in his cause for fighting for um, civil rights, uh, you know, and also for uh, foster in, in the foster care system, because uh, there is a large amount of, um, you know, disparity that's taken place there in the foster care system and how African-American kids are being handled and things that they're exposed to, uh, such as negligence, um, molestation. There are a lot of things that are going on that people are turning, you know, a blind eye and deaf ear to. And he's bringing awareness to these issues that these kids are dealing with in foster care. Uh, the, so, the other is social injustice, uh, where we're seeing officers killing black men and women. Uh, he led the way on Alfred Lo uh, Longro's case here in San Diego, who was shot and killed, and they were involved in bringing a civil suit against the city. Same thing with Stephen Clark in Sac Sacramento. He was a part of bringing that civil suit against uh, the city of uh, Sacramento that they won. And um, he's been very diligent, and he, and he stood behind you know, his, his passion for making sure you know, everyone, whether you're white or black, uh, you know, had their, their rights are being upheld, especially when it comes to civil rights. Uh, Shane was also involved in just the recent uh, in situation with George Floyd. He went out this past week and he delivered a check to the family. We donated money uh, towards their uh, funeral expenses. And obviously, if you guys are paying attention and you know, the world has really responded, the family's raised, well, $13 million thus far has been raised for that family. And that's the most that we've ever seen for any um, African-American or person of color that was murdered by police officers where their GoFundMe account uh, received that much money. That was a record. Um, and he's also diligent in other causes across the city of San Diego and L.A. County uh, in regards to equal rights and making sure that our local and state officials are being held accountable. So for Shane, he, he is a one-man show right now, aside from the board members that are providing support to him. But to be honest, um, economics and you know economic support is very much needed. Um, if you guys can donate to the cause uh, and helping Shane, there's travel expenses, security that's needed. I, that's one of the main things we discussed on our last board is that he does need security traveling with him when he's going to these places because unfortunately he's received multiple death threats, which is crazy. I mean, because Shane has basically worked for free majority of the time he's been in this position. and he's, he's lived and slept on people's couches. And it's not to put him out. This is what I've observed while still fighting for these causes and using his own money, which you're not going to find many people that are going to try to stand up for someone that they don't know, let alone for someone they do know that has been treated unjustly. Um, and he's been diligent in doing that. So financial resources are very important in regards to the movement and, and helping him uh, uh, you know, fight against the powers that be that are, you know, in these positions that are kind of right now, um, you know, allowing these things to happen, you know, within our police department and also within our local, um, you know, state, which is regarding to our state officials. So economic support is important. Also volunteers, volunteers, if you're available to volunteer time, you know, as far as organizing for our rallies or for any um, press releases that are going to be put out. Uh, there are a lot of resources that we need. Also, Shane is involved in the homeless in San Diego and L.A. He raises money there to feed the homeless, to also provide housing and shelter. So if you'd like to get involved, you can definitely reach out to us, uh, myself or Shane at thepeoplesalliance.com. Uh, uh, we have a link there on the website where how you can get involved and you can go there and you can reach out or you can say, hey, I'm willing to donate. There's a link where you can go and donate funds. Uh, to the organization. Uh, all money that is donated will be used towards the cause of fighting against uh, racial inequalities and injustice, and also in support of uh, our foster care kids within our kids of color within our foster care system, because a lot of them are being uh, neglected. Um, they're being abused physically and sexually, which is something a lot of people aren't aware of or not even willing to discuss or talk about. 
And he was one of those kids. Shane was a foster care kid because his mother and dad, dad died when he was young. His mom was uh, died of a drug overdose. And his dad had some health issues uh, that he passed away from. So he was left to be brought up in the foster care system. So he's a true believer of uh, really giving back and he lives by that. So any support that we can give him um, is what we're seeking. And, and, and I think that the more support that he can receive and awareness around what we're doing, is going to help us be more effective in our efforts in pursuit and bringing about justice for these victims that have been um, murdered or mistreated by uh, law officials. Well, Rod, the uh, you got you you definitely have your hands on, in a lot of different things, and and it sounds like a, a great organization. You'll get the links over to us for it to put in the notes. But if somebody wants to find it right now, tell us again what should they Google to, to find you and hit that People's Alliance for Justice. People's Alliance for Justice. Yeah, this. also Rod, tell us your uh, tell us your email if you want to share that uh, because you could get a lot of great inquiries yeah. from. Oh, hold on one second. Let, let me let me let my my personal email or the People's Alliance for Justice email. Oh, yours. Well, oh yeah, my you, email. My email. You can reach me at Rod at L A like Los Angeles L A V I P Agent dot com. So it's Rod at L A V I P Agent dot com. Yeah, we'll, we'll always get a handful of listeners that might be, they might reach out to you for advice on something. They might have a, a referral Absolutely. to send your way. They might, you know, there's all sorts of ways that people reach out, but we appreciate you being able to share your info. The, yeah, the, no the George Floyd GoFundMe, I said it, it, it had an absolute record for more, more donations, you know, than any other thing. So more than 500,000 people went and donated. So it's a great time where people yeah. are trying to get into action. That's just another step in the, yeah. I think the people's line. Sounds I like think that's a strong signal of change. Yeah, that's a, that, absolutely. That is a signal of change and awareness. And and, right. the, uh, and here's the other thing. Uh, here's another challenge too, and that is, uh, I'm gonna. I'm. I have not donated to his GoFundMe. I hadn't thought about it until we just had this conversation. And I'm gonna. I'm gonna donate to it today. Um, and here's the thing. Not only are we counting. Not only are the dollars going to make a difference okay to the family but also the number of people the sheer number of people if we got another 10,000 people to donate one dollar that would yes that would be another 10 grand but it would be another it would be another massive amount of people raising their hand and saying hey we hear this and we understand and politicians do listen to that um, Absolutely. you know when we had our conversation before um, one of the things I encourage people to do uh, was you know send emails uh, send emails to their to their congressmen, to their senators, to their local, to, to their local politicians. And there were people in the chat box. We had a big live audience. There are people in the chat box say, Hey, you know what? Um, you know, they don't listen. And, and by the way, I agree and I get it. And I'm also going to tell you, I was, I was living and working in government in Washington, DC. And even if they don't read it, they had somebody on their staff counting, right? So they like, Hey, we received a thousand emails from our constituents on this issue. That senator or whoever, they're they're paying attention. So a little bit of action actually can do do a lot. So it's another call to action for you guys. So really absolutely. appreciate it. Yes, absolutely. That is some great Rod, stuff. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, you know, Aaron, I appreciate your your uh all the help that you've uh, given to me and to us working together has been such a joy and, and the opportunity uh, for, for, to get us on with Rod today. I really appreciate you, Aaron and, and Rod, thanks for the time. You know, it was short notice and yeah, you're no just problem. like, Hey, that's good. Really, really appreciate yeah, it's it. All good. Yeah. yeah you know, I appreciate you guys having me on. And then for those that find value in, in hearing this message, uh, you know, appreciate you taking the time to hear it. And, um, Wish everyone, wish everyone well and the best. You know, we got a lot of work ahead of us coming up, you know, in the coming years. This isn't going to be over in six months. But I think if we all stay diligent in what, we, what, we're, what we're passionate about and what we believe in and we stay connected and unified, um, there's progress and unity. And as long as we stay unified, I believe we can start seeing the change that we want to see in this world and make it a better place for our kids, kids, kids that are coming into this world. That is so great, Rod. We are going to fast track this episode. As soon as we get this thing edited, it's going to go live. The you know right now we have a few weeks of recordings, but the this is the time that people need to be able to hear this. So I appreciate you coming on and being candid, giving us some great advice yeah. and some inspiration for all the people out there, Rod. So have a great day. Thanks for coming on. All right, thanks guys. Much appreciate. Have a great thanks day. Thanks a lot, Rod. No problem. No problem. Bye. Bye.
All right. Thanks, Rockstars. Rockstar Nation. Thank you for listening to Real Estate Rockstars. Listen, I need a favor. If you find this free content helpful, if you find our downloadable items from each guest helpful, please, I need you to pull out your pointing finger. Yes, the one finger that points at people and hit subscribe. Yes, subscribe. The more subscribers we get, the better we look in the ratings and the easier it is to get guests like Robert Kiyosaki, Barbara Corcoran, all the players that are on million dollar listing in the different cities. All that stuff makes it easier the more subscribers we get. So please subscribe. And listen, there's a lot of places you can leave comments. There's a lot of places you can like. We're on Facebook. We have an Instagram page. Instagram page is I am Pat Hyben. The Facebook is Real Estate Rockstars Radio. Feel free to leave us comments there. The most popular form of commenting seems to happen on YouTube. Yes, for whatever reason, it's a a very open environment. So just go to YouTube and go to Real Estate Rockstars Radio. Leave us comments there. Some of them we will read on the show. We love your feedback. So thanks, guys, and I hope you are having a great day. Oh, and also, listen, if you're going to subscribe and you haven't already left a review on iTunes, please do that too. Have a great day and thanks so much, Rockstar Nation. I really appreciate you.